We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. Uh oh, thrift diving. Hey, what's up? It's Serena Pia from thriftdiving.com, which is a podcast, a blog, and a YouTube channel that helps you decorate, improve, and maintain your home using paint, power tools, and thrift stores. And you know how we do here at Thrift Diving. We don't sacrifice our budget, the environment, or style. Welcome to episode 33 of the Thrift Diving Podcast. I've got something really fun for you today. And this is something that comes because my 11-year-old gave me an idea. <laughs> you know, he is a gamer. He follows these YouTubers who do gaming. And I told him recently that I had just hit 400,000 subscribers. And he said, Mommy, you've got to do like an Ask Me Anything video. You know, when you hit a milestone, you got to do these types of videos. This is what the gamers are doing. So I said, you know, that's actually a really good idea. So that's what I did. I posed the question to my YouTube channel. I posted it on the community wall there. So if you follow me, you may have seen that. You might even be one that I mentioned your question today. So today I thought that maybe we would go through some of these questions that people ask. Some of them were specifically about what my experience has been like, but some of them are questions regarding DIY. You know, they had some specific questions. So I thought today we could jump into those questions. It's really interesting because sometimes you don't think about everything that you do right? Like you've got your processes, you've got your daily activities, and it's just what you do. And it's when people stop and ask you these questions, it makes you think, hmm, I never really thought about it that way. So today we're going to jump into all these things. And some of my favorite questions were things like, you know, what are those things that you learned early on that if you could tell us to not make these mistakes, what would they be? <laughs> that one was a fun take fun question to answer. Another one that I really loved is, is there a room makeover that you're not happy with? And which one is your favorite so far? So we're going to jump into all of these questions. I did write a blog post that goes with this. So if you want to read those, you can hop over to the blog post. I will leave the link down below. But let's jump right into it and start with sort of my introduction. Because when I started thinking about this journey. You know, a lot of times people think building a YouTube channel is like being a kid at the top of a steep driveway and you've got this bouncy ball and they set it down and they go to roll it and they give it this slight push. And then think about, think of what a ball does. It starts to pick up speed and momentum with each roll, right? And then it just becomes unstoppable. Well, a lot of times people think a YouTube channel is like that. It's not really like that. I, I think it's more like building a snowman. So remember when you would go outside as a kid or with your kids and you would pack the snow in your hands, right? You'd form this tight little ball of hope. <laughs> like it can grow into something amazing. And you start rolling this ball through the snow. You're hoping that the other snow is going to stick and you're building up the base of this giant snowman. And while you're rolling it, it doesn't necessarily get easier. It just gets bigger, right? In fact, the bigger it gets, the harder it is to push. And it's not quite so round sometimes. <laughs> it's more like oblong and awkward. And that's what it's been like for my YouTube journey. It's been oblong and awkward with periods of where things really stuck. And I thought, that, okay, everything's starting to finally move. I'm growing my subscriber base. But then you look down and you realize, oh, this thing is kind of odd shaped and it's clunky and it's hard to push and it's falling apart. <laughs> That's what it's like having a channel. So, you know, regardless of how difficult it's been, hitting this milestone is impressive. I mean, 400,000 is something to celebrate. But the one thing that I want you to understand is that just because I have hit 400,000 subscribers, it just means that at one point or another, someone liked my videos enough to subscribe. That's really all it means. It doesn't mean that that person is even engaged. I can't tell you how many times I've subscribed to videos or to YouTube channels, and then I just never even go back. You know, I don't look at my notifications. I don't even see that they've posted anything new. And it may, may not be that I don't like them. I just I'm busy and I'm not following them and what they're doing. And I know people that are subscribed to me, it's the same way. Life gets in the way. They don't always come back after they subscribe. And I'm okay with that. So I'm telling you all this because I want you to know that I don't in any way let 400,000 subscribers get to my head. Like it doesn't blow my head up. <laughs> because most of those subscribers are not even watching my videos. It's the people who YouTube is 
is laying out my video for them and the discovery and all of that. So, you know, I'm thankful for my career and I am grateful for this milestone. And I think whenever, gosh, who knows how long that'll be. Whenever I hit a million, I'll celebrate then too. But again, it's just kind of an arbitrary number. Anyway, I went over to YouTube probably about a month ago, kind of bad with this. I was planning to get to this much sooner, but I posted over there. I said, okay, we're going to do this 400,000 subscriber, you know, ask me anything. And I got some really good questions and I want to jump into it right now. So the first question is, how does your husband and kids feel to have an internet star in the house? <laughs> this was a question submitted by What's Up Lizzie, and she congratulated me on the hard work, but she just wanted to know how do they feel living with an internet star? That's her words. <laughs> so I think that's a good question. You know, my kids, as cool as I think I am as a mom, my kids still think of me as a boomer, you know, and I try to tell them a boomer is someone who's like my mom's age, she's 66. But in internet speak, a boomer is someone who is like an uncool mom or dad, someone who's a little bit older, you know, not a millennial, someone who's older, I'm a Gen Xer. So they do tease me for being a boomer. And I but I, you know, I think they secretly do think that what I do is cool because I've overheard them at times bragging to their friends. And just a couple of weeks ago, we were randomly stopped by this woman at the organic store who recognized me. And so after we were done saying hello to her, the kids looked at me in amazement. They were like, whoa, my mommy is internet famous. And I'm like, yeah, I got it. You know, I just played it off and just made it like I was so cool, you know, just, just to appease them. <laughs> But generally, you know, the kids are unfazed by what I do online. And I would say the same is true for my husband. He really could care less that I do this. It doesn't really impress him. He doesn't, you know, he's not someone who really makes a big deal about anything, to be honest with you. <laughs> he he does support me now, and I will talk about that in just a little bit. But if I were to say to him, you know, I think I'm going to go back to work and just work a regular day job, he would just be like, Okay, like, you know, he's he's kind of a quiet person. He doesn't like a lot of his business online. So the fact that I'm online, I'm doing videos about our house, I'm sharing things with you. He would prefer if I didn't do that. But <laughs> he over the years, he's kind of gotten uh, used to the fact that this is just what I do. Like I share stories and pictures and videos. He just doesn't like to appear in any of them. So if you see him, it, you know, it's sort of like, uh, what do they call it? Chupacabra? <laughs> He, you know, you think he exists, you know, he exists somewhere, you think he does, but no one's ever really spotted him. You spot him sometimes, but you're not quite sure. So that's what it's like living with him. But generally, they're just not really phased by anything that I do. <laughs> okay, so the next question was submitted by Sarah, who said, who showed you, or who asked, who showed you how to use your first power tool? And this is a really good question, because you know, for as long as I can remember living on my own, I've always had, you know, a power drill that that's pretty basic. And so even though a, a drill is a power tool, I don't really consider that using tools because it's not a saw. It's not things that, you know, you can't really, well, you can kind of build something with a drill, but you need other tools. So anyway, who I have to thank partly is Ryobi. So back in 2013, I started going to these conferences called the Haven Conference. If you follow DIY bloggers, you probably have heard them talk about the Haven Conference. It's this DIY blogger conference. It's held every year in Atlanta. And Ryobi, several years ago, used to be a huge sponsor. I mean, they would throw these amazing parties. They'd have all this free food and they'd actually have alcohol there. They'd have, I mean, it was just, everybody looked forward to that Ryobi party. Well, on that particular year, that was my first year there. Oh, we went a little crazy. <laughs> so myself and all these people at the conference, we were just having a really good time. And we started asking them, hey, can we can we have these tools? You know, Ryobi had a wall set up of all their displayed tools, you know, right there by the food and drinks. So we started going over asking the Ryobi staff people like, hey, can can we have these? And I guess they had never encountered that before. So they just let us take these tools. So if you look at the blog post, you'll see this picture of myself, I'm holding up a circular saw. And I'm holding up at what most people call a sawzall, but it's a, reci a reciprocating saw. These were the first two tools that I ever picked up. 
and I got it from that conference. And when I got back to the hotel room, I snapped this selfie and I'm holding them up and the look of joy on my face, <laughs> because these were the first tools I'd ever used. And you figure at this point, I had been in my home three years, I think at that point, I'd never used tools. I was just painting furniture. So to finally get tools, this was pretty exciting. This was a big deal and I didn't have to pay for them. So the, the I will say that the only tool that I don't like to use or I will not use, I've used it before just doing a little demonstration, is a table saw. I have seen too many accidents where people have sliced off their fingers, they've made some sort of careless mistake. I mean, you know, we all know the joke about the shop teacher that has three fingers, right? <laughs> That's for a reason because table saws can be dangerous. And not just the blade itself, but if you go to make a, a cut and you're not you know, you're not careful, or you're just mindlessly cutting and not thinking about safety, you can have kickback, like major kickback in the gut or the forehead. So there are saws out there. There's one brand that I love uh, called Saw Stop. They actually make table saws that I guess it's got some sport, some sort of like special technology that if it detects, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if it's like it's not an electrical current, but I think it has like some sort of electrical current. And if it notices anything that's wet, so like your finger, right? Because you're made out of water. If you try to put a hot dog up to the blade, or if, even if you try to put a, a piece of green wood, and I say green wood, which is wood that hasn't yet, you know, evaporated a lot of the water, hasn't dried out, the the blade will automatically break. I mean, it's like, psh, like, oh my gosh, it's so fast. I've seen it done during a demonstration, that blade will drop and it'll break. And when I say break, as in like a car breaking, and all you have to do is replace the brake. I think it's maybe about $100 to replace the brake, but it pretty much saves your fingers. So if I were to get a saw, it would be a saw stop. But in the last number of months, I've been using a Festool track saw. And even though that brand is a little bit more expensive, I would definitely look at the Makita track saw. It's a little less expensive, but it works just as well. People people love it. But I have found that everything that I would have needed to do on a table saw, I don't have to use the table saw because the track saw allows me to do everything. And there's less risk and it's very safe. I've not had any incident with the track saw. So that is how I got started with tools. I really do attribute Ryobi to helping me get over some of that fear because sometimes at the conferences, they would actually have some of the tools there so that bloggers could try them. So I think the first time that I used a, I want to say a uh, jigsaw, that might have been the first time was at one of those conferences. So just having someone there to hold my hand, not literally, but to show me what to do and what not to do. Same thing with a routing table. I'd never used a router on a routing table, but at that conference, I was able to use it for the first time. And so when I was in my own shop, it felt comfortable. I knew what to do. And I think most people, when they're learning how to use tools, it's important to have someone there holding your hand, telling you what to do, what not to do. And if you have not already signed up, remember, I do have a power tools course that I am putting together. I'm literally in the middle of putting this together. And so some of you I'm going to be working with to help you get started with power tools. So remember, you can go to thriftdiving.com slash tools. If you're someone that's wanting, been wanting to learn to use tools, definitely go to that link, sign up. And when I'm ready to start opening this course up, you can be one of the people that get to work with me to learn how to use power tools. Because I know how important it is to not just be able to paint furniture, but to be able to use tools. Like the two really go hand in hand. All right, let's move on to the next question. This is submitted from someone named Dishonor on Your Cow. It's a really interesting name. <laughs> but they had asked, is there a room makeover that you're not happy with? And which one is your favorite so far? Again, another good question. You guys have all the amazing questions. Okay, so the room that I have never really been happy with is the garage. And technically, this is not a room in the house, but this is a room. I mean, I consider it to be a room because I use it so frequently as my workspace. I mean, you should have seen what this garage looked like when we moved in. It was pretty bad. If you want to see pictures of it, you can see it on the blog post that goes with this podcast. But it was just, it was uninspiring. It was dirty. The floor was just full of grease stains. It was not, 
it was not nice. And early on, I never even got to use the garage because I just brought in so much furniture from the thrift store that there was no space to even work. <laughs> you know, workspace? No, like this is my storage space. But the reason why it's been so dissatisfying over the years is because half of the garage houses the lawnmowers, the weed whackers. I've got this huge snowblower, pressure washer, this huge leaf vacuum, like all this equipment. It's impossible to make this space look pretty. So even if one side looks good and organized, you still have this other side that is just dirty looking lawn stuff. So you can never really just enjoy having a clean workspace. And then I realized too, that I, I have too many tools and materials with no good organizational system. I mean, when I first will get in there and start making things over, it looks great. But you know, one thing as a blogger, as a YouTuber, you have a lot of brands that send you stuff. And sometimes it's for specific projects. Sometimes brands just want you to, you know, try this thing for free. And remember, it's not free. I think we talked about that in one of the previous episodes in how bloggers make money. But these things that people are sending me, it's not free. I'm working for them. But then when I'm done using them for whatever promotion or thing that I'm working on, it usually just sits in there, <laughs> takes up space. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, I got to get in there and, and really donate a lot of the stuff that's in there. Maybe see if there's some people who live locally that might need some of this stuff or donate it to Habitat for Humanity. You know, uh, these are all great organizations, uh, you know, thrift stores, any of those places where some of the stuff just needs to go. But another reason that I'm not satisfied with the garage is because there's always more coming into the space. And I mean, as I mentioned, but the thing is, is that I don't always have places to put things, right? Like everything in order to have a clean and organized space, everything has to have its space. So when you're done with it, you know exactly where it goes, you can put it back there. And when you come back again, to, to look for it, it's in that space. Well, you know, what ends up happening with me is I'll bring something in, it could be materials for a project, and it just sits cluttered on the workbench, because I don't know where it goes, or I may need it for an upcoming project, or there's no more space to store that thing. So this is the these are all the reasons why I'm just really not happy with the garage. And you know, this is one reason why I'm getting a, sh a huge shop. Oh, by the way, I will update you my 16 by 26 shed for my backyard. That's going to be my new dedicated workspace. It's going to be installed on Thursday, September 30th. I am so excited. And I'm just hoping that it does not end up being a mess like my garage. <laughs> we will see. But to answer the question, what is my favorite makeover? I would have to say that's my master bathroom. And the reason why is because everything that I did in that room was kind of like a big deal, right? Like this was the first time that I'd ever built a bathroom vanity. I'd never built anything so large. And I decided the old one was going to come out and I was going to create a new one. At that time, I didn't know how to use SketchUp. I just literally drafted it on paper, had an idea in my head of what I would do. And I found these, I don't even know if they were legs or if they were spindles to you know, some, something I got from the, re no, it wasn't the restore, one of those salvage spots. And I decided I was going to turn these legs into a vanity. And it looks amazing. Again, you can see it on my blog. But because it took so much time and effort to build this 60 inch double sink custom vanity, it really has become my favorite room. It's the one that I'm most proud of. It's the room that, you know, initially when I was getting quotes for uh, taking out the old fiberglass shower and getting some tile in there. They quoted me literally like $6,000 to, to do that kind of shower. I said, no, we're going to get some paint. This is not regular paint from Home Depot. This is like some specialty epoxy paint. We're going to paint the shower. We're going to build the vanity. I made this really cute window what do you call it? It's like a little window privacy screen. I made that. I mean, it just, it's, it's a great room. I even did like board and batten. It's a pink purple. So it's the room that I think really came together by bringing a lot of different skills into one room. And that's why that is my favorite room. And of course, you can find the links down below. Angela Roy had asked me, did your first DIY project go as planned? Well, she said first project. Now first project could be DIY. It could be you know, that encompasses a lot. It could be my first build, my first room makeover, my first furniture makeover, 
but I think what she meant was my first furniture makeover, so I'll stick with that. So this was several years before I had children, and I found this cute little mid-century modern table at the thrift store for like $10. It had this cute steel base. I mean, you could tell that it was it was a pretty good quality table. It did have some ugly veneer on it. I bought it for our two-bedroom condo. We didn't have any kids, didn't have a lot of money even at that time. But as a teenager, I loved going to thrift stores, finding vintage clothing. And now, you know, we had this two-bedroom condo and I was going to find a few pieces of furniture for that. So I painted it with this bright red latex paint and I kept that thing for years. I still have that table. And several years ago, I was going to actually donate it to the thrift store. I was going to get rid of it. And I felt some kind of way about it because it is my first project. You know, you get attached to those first, right? So instead of getting rid of it, I just decided to put a different coat of paint that matched the colors in my basement. And it's sitting down here now. Like it's, it's really, really cute. It's a simple table. It's probably no more than, you know, two and a half feet off the floor, but it looks great with a little lamp on it. So that was my first project. I didn't mess it up. And that's what I would tell people when you're nervous. And when Angela had submitted her question, she did say she was, she wants to start flipping furniture, but she's a little nervous that she'll fail. And what I would tell you, Angela, is to definitely make sure that you're starting with small projects. Don't take on something that's overwhelming because then you may not even get started. So I would say either find something very small in your house that doesn't have a lot of sentimental value or go to the thrift store, find something for $10, $15 that if you quote unquote ruin it, or if you don't like it, you could literally just send it back to the thrift store. Like you don't care. It's just your practice piece. And I think once you do that, you feel so comfortable that you're ready to move on to your next project, which might be a little bigger. And then, you know, you'll start feeling comfortable being able to flip furniture once you're confident in your skills that it's you're not going to ruin it. Okay, so Rome Diddy, love that name, Rome Diddy, he asked me, did your family and husband support your dream to become a thrift diver? <laughs> Definitely not, Rome Diddy. No, my husband, as I mentioned, he's very rigid in his ways. He loves routine. It gives him comfort. And when I go and start shaking things up, which I do often, it makes him feel very unsettled, very anxious. And remember, I started my blog in 2010 when we bought this house, and it was 2012 when I started realizing, oh, people are making money doing this? Okay, I'm down. I'm going to figure out how to turn this into a moneymaker. Well, and I still loved it, right? Like I wanted to make money doing something that I loved. Well, Evenings and weekends, it was all about the blog, doing projects. And I worked, you know, just nine to five type job. And nights and weekends was all about blogging. But I decided I wanted to go full time. And I was going to try to make it happen fall of 2015. Now it was late 2014 at the time. And I thought, okay, I'm going to start saving money. And I'm going to make this happen 2015. Well, I got fired months earlier, (laughs) before I had a real plan on how I was going to go full time. But it was a blessing. It was scary, but it was a blessing. My husband was not on board. I literally came home and jumped up and down. Like I was excited to finally be out of there. It was a toxic work environment. It wasn't going well. And when I went home, I just told my husband, hey, let's, you know, let's try to do this blogging thing for just give me three months. He was not on board. He wanted me to go find another job. And technically, I had to look for another job since I was collecting unemployment. So I looked. But I said, if I can't find, you know, if things don't go well, I mean, if I find a job, then I'll consider it. But if I, you know, focus on this blogging thing, and it takes off, then this is what I want to do. He was not on board. Well, anything, anyway, things picked up and I consistently started earning more money than than I'd ever did in my day job. And eventually he came around. He didn't speak negatively about what I do, but he's the kind of person that if I were to tell him today, hey, I think I want to go back and just get a day job. Like I just want to work nine to five Monday through Friday, like most people. Can Can I do that? He would actually be okay with that, you know? And it just wouldn't be an issue for him. And I think I I like his support, but I think it's not even just support. It's he really doesn't care as long as I'm paying the bills. (laughs) And as long as I'm happy. So he's not super supportive. 
but he's improved over the years. But, you know, whatever it is I decide that I want to do, he would be, he'd kind of be okay with it. And even if he wasn't okay with it, he knows that I, I'm probably going to do what I want to do anyway, because he respects my, my ability to make a decision for what's going to be okay for our family, right? Like I'm not someone who makes decisions and just haphazardly does things. So, you know, he kind of leaves it up to me. So to answer your question, Rome Diddy, yes, he supports me, but it didn't, it didn't happen right away. All right. So the next question, (laughs) this was a question submitted by little bits of everything. They said, what's a good starter project for a beginner with a nail gun? She just bought a Ryobi nail gun and she wants to use it for an easy project. So I would say, first of all, I love nail guns. I think they're great for adding baseboards around your house. If you're doing any sort of decorative trim on the walls, like board and batten. I've done board and batten in two of my rooms. I did it in my kid's bathroom. And this is just using 18 gauge brad nails. And I did it in my bathroom as well. And you, of course, you want to angle those those brad nails down so that it doesn't pull away from the drywall. You can also use some construction adhesive to secure the boards. But remember, if someone or you decide that you want to remove them, it's going to rip the drywall. So if you want it to be permanent, great. If you want to just use a nailer, angle them down and make sure that you're using like two inch nails. But I think that's an easy project. But even if you have an easy project, you still need to know how to use something that's a saw. You're going to have to cut something in order to put it on your wall or to construct something. So I would definitely recommend learn how to use a jigsaw. It is one of the least intimidating tools for you to learn. And you'll be able to cut anything with wood, plastic. You can actually cut metal with a jigsaw, a very thin sheet of metal. So there's a lot of things that you can do. Another project I think that's great to do with a brad nail is to make little trays or little boxes. So think of serving trays that you could use for like the spring and summer. You have people coming over, you're taking things to and from the kitchen to the patio, and you'll need a tray. And so if you make your own out of wood, or like a little box or something like that, these are great opportunities to use a nailer. You just have to be careful because The thing about nailers is that you can shoot your nails through the wood. So if you've never used a nailer, you're probably wondering, well, Serena, what do you mean by that? But what it means is when you're putting two pieces of wood together, let's say you're making a little box. You're putting two pieces of wood together. You go to use the nailer. And as you're shooting, the bottom, the the lower, I guess you could say the nail shoots out the side and destroys your project. It's very hard to get those nails out once you shoot them out. So there are some tips and tricks that I have for using nailers. So if you want to know what they are, you're going to have to sign up to do my Power Tools course. So be sure to go to thriftdiving.com slash tools because these are all the things that I'll teach you and how to use these tools. I can't cover everything in a podcast, but we can do it in a course. All right. So those are some things that you can do. Oh, and I will point out that I made these really cool pegboard containers out of wood. And you know, it doesn't support a lot of weight because it's just on a pegboard, but these were perfect to use for, um, you know, just building little things for your pegboard using a nailer. So you can make a lot of things with just a nailer and a jigsaw. Okay. So the next question, or I should say questions comes from someone named S. Mac Angus. <laughs> All right. So they said, congratulations, very best wishes for this continued success. Here are my questions that I'm curious about. And there's four questions that they submitted. Number one, how often do you suffer from burnout or a desire to quit YouTube and return to a regular job? Question number two, who, if any, home DIY decor bloggers or YouTubers inspire or educate you? The third question was regarding my ability with power tools. What's my story? And am I self-taught? I think we talked about that one a little bit already. And the other question, well, actually there's several, is what are your early learned the hard way experiences that you can spare us? And she also asked about which which tools I think are most safe and most dangerous. I think we already addressed that. And the last one, in your opinion, what are the top five elements, habits, practices, or personal gifts do you attribute to your YouTube success? So that's a lot. Those are a lot of questions, but I think... We're going to break down a few of these, and I I love these questions. It's really good. So the first one, have I suffered from blogger burnout or a desire to quit and return to a regular job? 
And I would say, you know, blogger burnout is a real thing. Early on, back when I was working a nine to five, and I heard people talking about blogger burnout, I thought it was garbage. I was like, come on, they have like the best job in the world. Why would they be burnout? But I have experienced some burnout, but not to the point ever to the point where I wanted to quit. You know, I will admit there are times when I think it's stressful. And uh, sometimes I'll wonder, I'm like, man, if I had a regular nine to five, you know, where when you hear people say it's Friday, that that means something. <laughs> because when you work for yourself, or you're a blogger, or a YouTuber, Friday doesn't mean anything like there's no real Friday, because the weekend is just extra time, not even extra to catch up on things that you didn't get done during the week. So there really is no day off. But you know, when I think about having to report to a supervisor, which I hated to do, when I think about having to get permission to take time off for a doctor's appointment, or if I just want to take the day off, I've got to ask someone, you know, hey, can I can I take off or leave a little bit early? I don't like having to do that. You know, and I think about the financial cap on what I can earn when I worked outside the home, you had your yearly review, and you might get maybe a two or 3% increase. And that was about it. You know, somebody else was determining how much money you earned. I didn't ever want to experience going back to any of those things again. I love the freedom that my blog, my YouTube channel, I can't even say my podcast because I'm not making money off of this podcast. I mean, this is just something I do because I love to do it. I mean, all of it's things I love to do. But you know, I, I really have not collected not even a dollar yet <laughs> from this podcast. I show up every week because I love to do it. I love talking to you. And I think it's a way to reach you with my ideas and, and my tips and tricks and all of those things that I can't do in a blog post or, you know, in a YouTube video per se. But I will admit it gets stressful at times. And I think the stressful part is having to meet brand deadlines, right? Remember when I talked about in an earlier episode, working with brands, how bloggers make money. Well, some of us, we monetize our blogs by working with brands. And I think some brands can be very flexible, but some brands can be very demanding. In fact, there's a brand that I just was working with just this week, actually. It's been a long going, it's, it's actually been ongoing for a while, but I just posted it on my blog. I had these vintage Henrodon headboards. I mean, they, they were just amazing. And I turned them into beds for my kids. So you can see that on my blog. Just go to thriftdiving.com. But the brand that sponsored that blog post, oh my gosh, their demands were crazy. It's like, you know, you have to tell them up front what you plan to do and, and how you're going to do it. And then once you write your blog post, they have to go through and approve everything. And then when you're working on the blog post and writing it all up, thinking that you've done a good job, you get it back and they're like, oh, we've got to take this link out because, you know, this is our post. You can't link to any other post that's sponsored. Even if it's not a competitor, we, we don't allow that. So that's stressful having to work with a, a, a brand that's so demanding. It's like having a supervisor all over again. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like someone's telling you, oh, you can't put that in your social media post or, you know, you didn't have that approved. So we need, to, you know what I'm saying? Like, so it's so restrictive that I know that I'm never going to work with that brand again. But it's times like that when you're, when you realize like, okay, well, how much control do I really have over what I'm putting out there? Because if someone is telling me what I can do and what I can't do, you know, you're still reporting to someone who has your paycheck in your, in their hand, telling you what you can and cannot do. And then sometimes, and I don't like that, and sometimes projects all converge together at once, and it leaves me feeling anxious, and it can take the joy out of doing what I love. In fact, I have a friend who he's pretty, you know, he's pretty successful, and, you know, there's times when he's like, man, I just, I just want to quit, and it really comes down to the brands. You know, he's had brands walk away from him in the middle of a project because they just decided to change course after he's put time and effort you know, that's, that's demoralizing when you've put all this time and effort into something. And, you know, you have a brand tell you mm, that's, that's not good enough. So, you know, sometimes I think what can happen with bloggers and YouTubers, you, you can sometimes lose control of your content. And you have these brands telling you what you can and cannot do that kind of stress does sometimes take the joy out of what you're doing. Even if you're enjoying making these beds for your kids, the fact that you have to show the product, you have to tell about the product, you know, like sometimes you just don't want to do all that. 
But, you know, of course, they've got to get their return on investment. And, you know, they don't want to waste their money. It's got to be a, a good business deal for them. But it does take some of the creativity out of what you can do. So have I ever wanted to quit? No, because I feel that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be creating and building and inspiring people. And this is the way that I have been able to fulfill that calling in my life. So would I ever quit? No. Would I ever change course? Yes. But you can guarantee that I will always be creating, inspiring and teaching because that's what I'm here on earth to do. That's what I'm meant to do. And I know that without a doubt. But whether it would be a YouTube channel or a blog or, you know, live in person seminars, courses, like that's what I'll be doing. I'll be doing something like that, that would allow me to still be in contact with you and to create an inspiring teach you. All right, moving on to the next one. She asked, uh, who, if any, home decor YouTubers inspire or educate me? <sighs> you know, I'll be honest here. I don't follow many YouTubers. I don't really watch any home decorating shows. <laughs> Are you gasping right now? Are you just so surprised by that? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I'm sorry, but I just, I feel like the more time that I spend watching what other people are doing, the more I will either want to create something similar to what they're doing or be influenced by what's on trend. You know, what's everyone posting about? Oh, they're posting about pumpkins. Oh, I've got to do these pumpkins too. I don't really want to ever be that kind of blogger or YouTuber. I really just sort of lead by my own, whatever I'm working on, whatever I want to do. But there is one YouTuber that I really like. I don't get to watch her often, but there's times when there's certain tools or accessories that I am using that I've never used before. So I will go to YouTube and search, and there is a YouTuber, a channel called C. Jane Drill. If you have watched her, you know this woman, Leah, is amazing. She is like, she. I, I, in fact, I think she was a teacher uh, like a carpentry teacher or con some sort of construction trade uh, where she was teaching. And you can tell she just has like a natural um, teaching ability. You know, she talks to you in a way that just it's it's kind, it's, it's loving, it's you just want to, oh gosh, you could probably put her on all day and just watch and listen to her. But she knows what she's doing. And I love her. Another person that I love is Mike Holmes. Remember those that show called Holmes on Home? Well, Homes on Homes, I think it may still air. I follow him on Facebook. So every day when I log in, I, you know, he's sort of at the top of my list and I see his tips and tricks and other things that he posts about. And, you know, his show was amazing. Uh, it was basically where he would go and help home homeowners who purchased these homes that were like lemons, right? They had inspections done, but the inspector didn't catch all 50, 11 different things that was wrong with the house. So he comes in with his crew, corrects all the problems that were done wrong, and just kind of gets you set straight. So I love him. I'm inspired by him. And then also, I will mention my friend Glenn from DIY Creators. He is on YouTube. He's got like 3.5 million subscribers. He gets tons of views on his videos. And he inspires me because he's very authentic in what he does. I know him personally, I know how hard he works, and I respect people who are really sort of running their, their channel themselves, right? It just feels more organic than if someone has a whole team of people that, you know, is behind the scene. So I, I'm kind of for the little guy. <laughs> I, I mean, at 3.5 million, he's not little by any means, but, you know, I know that he does everything himself, and I appreciate people that are like that. All right. So the next question that she asked was, what were your learn the hard way lessons? All right. So the first thing that came to my mind for this was when I built that bathroom vanity that I told you about, I took the measurements from the top and well, but let me, let me back up a little bit. So this vanity has the way that I designed it. It's got two drawers on the left, two drawers on the right, and then two, uh, what do you call them? Doors on the front. And it's 60 inches, right? So when I was fitting the drawers into the space, I took the measurement from the top, but I didn't take the measurement from the bottom. Now, remember, there's two drawers on the left, like, you know, one on top of the other and two on the right. So the ones on the right, no problem. Everything went in fine. The ones on the left, I went to put the drawer in 
and it wouldn't even fit. Like it got stuck halfway in. And I realized, oh my gosh, Serena, you took the measurement for at the top of the vanity, but you didn't measure down below. So it wasn't even. So you can't take a drawer, a nice, even, straight drawer, and put it into something that has two different dimensions. <laughs> so what I learned from that and what I would tell you is to always take as many measurements as possible. And this is why I taught myself how to use SketchUp. SketchUp, for those of you that don't know, is a, it's like a CAD software that will allow you to sketch up and draw your, your project in a computer program. And so when you're doing this, everything's going to line up. And if it doesn't line up, you'll be able to kind of zoom in and see and check your measurements along the way. When I built my vanity, I didn't have that. I couldn't go in there and see, you know, okay, I, you know, I would have had to have gotten kind of far down there in the box. So I've, I've learned along the way to make sure that you're measuring every part of your project before you, before you try to move on to the next step. But some other lessons quickly that I learned is to always buy the best tools that you can afford. Now, I know some people are on strict budgets and I still recommend Ryobi tools for those people. And as you, and, and those tools will work fine. I know that there are, you know, some professional builders that will still use Ryobi tools. But for me, I just recently in the last six months or so, well, maybe seven months, upgraded to Festool and they're very expensive. But when I first started out, I never would have bought Festool. You know, I had to sort of work my way up. But, you know, if you can afford to buy, like, let's say even Ryobi, Ryobi tools are still good tools that might be one step up compared to, you know, something that you get from, oh, what's the name of that store? I can't remember the name of it. What's the name of that store? Harbor Freight. There it is. <laughs> Harbor Freight. And these tools can work fine too. But I just find that the better tools that you can afford, you usually get better cuts and they just have certain features. I mean, of course, your cut also depends on your blade, but they have certain features that make it a little bit more intuitive to get good quality cuts. The other lesson that I learned is that you can never buy too many accessories that help you with measuring and getting straight cuts. So if you happen to find that there's some accessories that promise you to, to be able to quickly measure things or to help you get straight cuts, buy them because they do work and they do help you. The other thing I learned is that you can't paint every piece of wood furniture. Like sometimes you have to enjoy the grain of the wood. Maybe you strip it and do something that's more natural so you can see more of the grain. But what I learned along the way is that you shouldn't paint every single piece of wood. Even though you love pops of color, some pieces should just be left alone. And then the last little lesson that I learned is to only buy what you love. Don't buy what's popular because then you end up with a lot of mismatched furniture that you really don't personally love. You just thought, it, oh my gosh, this is popular. This is a good deal. And then you end up just having a lot of stuff and you don't really love any of it. So only buy what you love, not what's popular. Okay, moving on to the next question. Do you think, this is from someone that says, we've got it for you. Do you think you will do any collaboration videos with other DIYers? Eh, it's possible. Like I mentioned before, I usually operate with blinders on. So this isn't something that I am actively trying to do. And a lot of times, YouTubers only do collaborations so that they can grow their channel. So if I've got an audience of, let's say, 400,000 subscribers and Let's say there's somebody else that's got 600,000. Well, we could probably collaborate so that I'm reaching their audience. They're reaching my audience. I don't really focus too much on growth. I'll be honest with you. I mean, I know that I'm kind of celebrating 400,000 subscribers here today. However, it's not really that important to me. So that's why I don't really collaborate because I don't really care about reaching other people to grow and get bigger. I just care about putting out as good of videos as I possibly can. All right, next next question. In your opinion, what are the five top elements, habits, practices, or personal gifts do you attribute to your YouTube success? This one's a hard one for me to answer because I know that there's a lot of savvy things that we can do to help us like beat the algorithms and get in front of more people and get more clicks and all of that. So I, I'm not even going to say that. I mean, I will say that consistency is key, right? Like if you start a YouTube channel and you're posting videos for a year and then you stop for a year and then you try to come back for a year, that's not really going to work for you. So one, one thing I'll say is I have been consistent over the last 
gosh, what was it, 2012, nine years, nine years since I've had my channel. Now, I've not been consistent where every day at, I mean, every Wednesday at 11 o'clock I'm posting. I'm not that consistent. I just can't. When I'm working on projects, I may not be done in order to have a video for you by Wednesday at 11. But I still show up at least once a month, you know, hopefully every, you know, two to three weeks or something like that. But here's what I would say has been most important for me to succeed on my channel. Number one, because I love to do it. And number two, because I'm good at it. And I know that's not something that's more concrete, but it's so true. And I'll tell you a quick story. Years ago, before I started having kids, we were required to do like some personal development for our job. And I decided to take a public speaking class. It was four Saturdays. You go present, learn how to present. And great, I was able to check that off. Well, at the end of the course, as people were leaving the class, you know, we went by to shake the instructor's hand. And he grabbed my hand and he lowered his voice and said to me, you know, you should be doing this. And I didn't really know what he meant by this. I'm like, you mean presenting or like, what do you mean? I said, well, I mean, I kind of get to present a little bit at my job, but it, you know, it wasn't my career. I think at that time I was, gosh, I don't even know what it was. I can't even remember the name of the place, but I remember the place. But anyway, I didn't present a lot. And I never really forgot what this man had said to me because he was able to see in, inside of me something that I wasn't able to see until later. But it was always something that I remembered that he had said, like, oh, he saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. Hmm, I wonder what he meant by that. But when I think about what it was I used to do even as a kid, right, when I was 18, 17, 18, we went on vacation once. And remember those big camcorders, like the one that Chevy Chase used in National Lampoon's Christmas or Summer Vacation? you know, those big 1980s and 90s camcorders. Well, we had rented one of them once to go on a summer vacation. And I would set that camera right on the edge of the table, kneel down like on my knees. And I'd say, hi, this is Serena McCann coming to you live from Marburn Road, right? <laughs> McCann, that's my maiden name. So I would pretend that I was doing live video, even at the age of 17, 18, I might even have been a little bit younger. So even at that time, it was something that I, I must have loved or was good at, but didn't know until years later. And it wasn't until 2012 that I started my YouTube channel. And when I look at my first video, I've got to find the clips that didn't go in my first video. I found it a couple of years ago, and I think I saved it somewhere. It was horrific. <laughs> it was horrible. I was like in my living, no, I was in my... Okay, the first video that I did was how to paint your brick fireplace. I remember I called in sick that day to work because I didn't have any vacation time. And I was going to do my first YouTube video. You can find it. If you go to my channel, just, you know, look for thrift diving paint fireplace. And the video had okay quality. Uh, the quality wasn't good. You couldn't even hear because I didn't even have a mic. And I'm painting my fireplace. But before I got to that point, I started doing some like pre videos and they were so bad. I was in my dining room. I'm trying to show the products. I'm talking to the camera by putting my, like I'm putting my hair up into a ponytail at the same time that I'm talking. I'm not even smiling. I mean, it was just a horrific video, but it's funny to look at that compared to what I am able to do now. And it's been this evolution. So to go back to the original question, you know, the top five elements or practices, I would really say, you know, you have to do it because you love it. You know, if you're only doing it because you're trying to make a buck, you can do that. But, you know, money is not everything. Money is it because if it was people that were making tons and tons of money, they would all be happy and they're not. They're in jobs that they hate and they hate getting up going to them every day. So money is not everything. But I continue to show up doing videos because I love doing them. I actually love to edit. I love being in front of the camera. I think I have a natural ability to do it and do it well. And I just you know, I kind of go with with that. <laughs> and I love teaching people. So yeah, anyway, long answer to a, a short question. Okay, the next question is from Creole Lady 182. And she asked, how did you set up and plan your workshop? Now, remember, I told you my garage workshop has never been done. I never felt like it was exactly what I wanted. But I am planning a workshop right now. And I did tell you about my shop that's coming very soon. But I would say when you're planning a workshop, think about what tools and equipment you'll be using. 
And you're going to need outlets for these things if they're not battery operated. So like for me, I've got, what is it called? I've got a scroll saw. That's plug in. That's not battery operated. Um, I've got, oh gosh, what is it? I've got a drill press. I've got things that I've not even really been able to use because I don't have space for them. So when you're planning a shop, think about all the tools that you want to be using and where are they going to sit? Do you have enough counter space to, you know, sit a little like a, like a bench sander? Are you going to need that for the type of projects that you're working on? And where are you going to cut materials? You probably want to have a table that's like four by eight because that's going to be big enough to hold a full sheet of plywood. Now there are these tables and I will leave a link down below by Craig. I actually own two of these. It's called their mobile project center tables because these can actually be configured to hold a large sheet of plywood so that you could use this as a table. You know, they're like sawhorses, but you know, they're pretty flexible. I love them. And then also you just have to have lots of storage bins, things for screws, nails, you know, when I've gone to salvage shops, whenever I see little drawers, I love little like cabinets, metal cabinets with drawers. I go crazy for them <laughs> because they're perfect for, for storing the nails and the screws and all those things that you just really don't know where to put. And I would definitely recommend dust extraction. You know, most times when people are just starting out working with power tools, they don't realize how dangerous dust is. If you're breathing this stuff in when you're cutting, you're not wearing a dust mask this stuff can get into your lungs and make you really sick and even cause cancer. You don't want that. And especially some different varieties of wood is even more dangerous than others. So what I would definitely recommend is that you, well, there's a couple things you can do when you're just starting out, you're not going to be able to afford, you know, the, the expensive dust extractions, but here's a little tip. You can actually take one of those box fans, you know, the kinds that people put into your, like in your windows, you can take a little cheapy box fan and on the back of it, tape one of those HVAC filters, right? Like the kind that, you know, the pleated ones that tend to go into your HVAC system, tape that to the back. And then you can actually put a fan up to the area where you're working, or you could even put it in a window and blow the fan, I, I blow it, you know, blow it out but you make sure that you have this filter on it. So as it's sucking the, the dust out of the workspace, the workshop, it's going to be capturing those particles. So I, I actually had heard from someone, I think he's got, oh, and yeah, I'm thinking, I'm sorry. I'm trying to think as I'm talking to you, my son and I, we took a scroll saw class and the guy, no, it wasn't scroll saw. We took a lathe. We took a lathe pen making class. And the man who was teaching the class, he told us, he said, I, I still use that, you know, just a box fan with, you know, a, a filter on the back of it right underneath of my lathe. So all those, you know, little particles floating down, those heavy pieces, he said, it'll just, you know, be sucked up right into the filter. So this is something that actually can work for you. So I would definitely try that. If you're looking for more instruction on that, just, you know, do a Google search. I'm sure you'll find it. But make sure that you're getting that dust out. In my new shop, I'm going to get an air filtration system. I was just looking at one the other day. I think it was $600, $700, kind of expensive. But from the reviews, I can tell that uh, this thing is going to remove all those little floating particles that stay in the air long after you're done cutting your wood. And the last thing I would say when planning a workshop is think about having a painting station. Don't ruin your workspace with getting paint everywhere. You know, it, it can get on your table. So what I do is I've got a really nice table that I use for my cutting station. But what I'll do is I'll have a, you know, maybe like a two by four, not a two by four, but like a two foot by four foot board, you know, just a little piece of, uh, you know, old scrap wood. I'll put that over the table. And that's where I'll do my painting and staining. So when I'm done, I'll take that and put it away. So those are just a few things to think about when you're setting up your workspace. All right, let's move on to the next question because I know this podcast is getting long. Are you still with me? Are you still listening? Okay, this is a personal question that came from the Terminator 1919. They asked, what do you do with your kids for fun? Well, my kids are a little older now, 15, 11, and 9. And one thing that we've been doing lately that's a lot of fun, we've been going to the workout the workout room lifting weights, right? We've got this community center that's got some weights. My oldest son will work out together and then the other two, they go play basketball. This has been 
something we've been doing since June. It's been amazing. You should see my muscles. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I am getting so fit. And my oldest son, he's getting fit too. He's pretty skinny. So he's building up some muscles. So we'll do that. At night, we also like to cuddle up and we watch a lot of inappropriate sitcoms. <laughs> we have watched The Office. And if you love The Office, you know how inappropriate they are on there. So but yeah, we've watched that and the kids just laugh it off. And they're like, Mommy, we already know that like, you know, come on, we're not babies anymore. I'm like, well, you're still my baby, you shouldn't be hearing this stuff. But we'll watch like Fresh Prince of Bel Air, Upshaws. That's with Mike Epps on Netflix. And then we just finished Marlon with Marlon Wayans on Netflix. Oh my gosh, you have to watch that. It's so funny. It's not appropriate for little kids, but it's funny. Okay, we got a few more questions left. Tiny Jungle Joy asked, is electrical DIY is as scary as it seems? And I would say yes. I would say electrical wiring should definitely be respected because it can kill you if you do the wrong thing. And I know that sounds scary and I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not trying to really scare you, but I'm just trying to be truthful. But I will tell you this. You know, if you're replacing things that are already there, for example, if you're changing an exterior light or maybe a light in your kitchen, or maybe you've got one of those outlets where every time you plug it in, the cord falls out because it's just loose. It's just, it's old and it needs to be replaced. You can replace those yourself and it's not difficult. You just have to make sure that you're cutting power to that switch or to that electrical outlet. And the only way that you really know for sure is to go to your panel and start trying out, you know, usually it's labeled. You'll see, you know, you'll see everything labeled. My house is old. And so sometimes how they have it labeled, I'm, I'm like, what are you talking about? But you just want to make sure that you're finding the right circuit and you're flipping the switch and you're turning that power off. And here's the thing, just because you're turning off power to the living room, which, is, or the, let's say the family room where you're changing that light doesn't necessarily mean you have killed all the power in that living room. So you want to go back and check to make sure, like, for example, in my family room, I've got like two circuits in my living room. I keep saying living room. You know what I'm talking about. So, you know, just because I cut the power where it says living room doesn't mean everything has been cut because there may be some, some switches that are on a different circuit with the hallway lighting. You know what I'm saying? So you just have to know and understand how to turn that off. You can even get little uh, electrical devices at the hardware store. So you can plug that into the outlet to see whether you really did kill this, the power to that switch. So, you know, keep doing your research and just remember you can change you know, these things that are existing, if you are trying to add like new lighting, those things are a little bit more difficult, more challenging. And I would say if you're not comfortable, leave it to the, the professionals. Hiring an electrician can be expensive. But what's more expensive hiring an electrician, or having to build a whole new house because you burned it down. And you know, you didn't realize you were wiring things wrong incorrectly. <laughs> you know what I mean? So think of it that way. But I will tell you, I, I thought, I used to think that electrical wiring was just so boring. I'm in a carpentry program at my community college and I had to take some electives. Electrical wiring was one that I signed up for and beforehand I was dreading the class. I thought it was just going to be a bore, but it was the most interesting topic. I could not believe the teacher was excellent and you know, after sitting through the class, I decided that I was going to sign up for the next course which was residential wiring. And in the laboratory, like there down the hallway, there was like, like a tiny home, right? And so there was a kitchen, there was bedrooms and all of these things. And our job was to figure out where we were going to be wiring things based on electrical code requirements. And we were going to wire this entire building. Well, then guess what happened? Freaking COVID. It shut everything down. So we were left with all of our wires all of our conductors running through the building, but we hadn't even made any of the connections yet. We didn't even get to, to learn how to connect it to the service panel. So I was so disappointed that we didn't get to do that. But one thing I learned is that electrical is like a puzzle. You know, you have to figure out how to get those electrons from the service panel to the load. And the load is basically like the light, the outlet, the microwave, the washer, anything you're trying to get power to. In the electrical world, they call it the load. 
And then you have to get those electrons back from the load to the service panel. So it's literally a giant loop. And I didn't even realize that. <laughs> but electrical wiring is how will you connect this all so that those electrons float everywhere they need to to give you power and then go back to the service panel. So for me, it's like a puzzle and I love puzzles. So I'm actually thinking of taking that class over again, just so I could finish all those things that we didn't get to do. But be on the lookout because I will be adding some electrical stuff to my channel and to my blog soon. The next question comes from Laura Cristina Valdez. She said, what part of a project is not your favorite? You know, what do you feel less drawn to or excited about? And she said for her, it's the sourcing of materials and tools. Because anytime she gets an idea, she gets discouraged by actually having to go out and buy and select things. And she wishes that she could just snap her fingers and have everything that she needs for a project right in front of her and ready to start. <laughs> Laura, I feel you, girlfriend. Getting started is the worst part of a project going around trying to find everything when you're not sure what you even really need or what you even really want. It's so exhausting. But here's what I try to do. I try to make a list of everything that I think I need or I know I need. And the one good thing about the longer you DIY is that you start storing things up, right? Like you start having multiple cans of spray paint. So when the next project comes, you don't necessarily have to go out and get a whole new thing of spray paint, unless it's a different color. You may already have some of that available on, on hand. But I think having a list of what you need actually helps. And, you know, for me, getting started with a project is sometimes, sometimes the hardest part because what happens is you're not sometimes really sure how to get started on a project. And you might be a little worried that it's not going to work out. But what I find that helps me is sometimes writing down the steps to a project makes it easier to get started because instead of thinking about the whole project and what needs to get done and how, I guess, overwhelming it can seem sometimes, when you have step-by-step -step written out, it helps to break it down into chunks. And when you check it off, you're like, okay, cool. First thing I did was I printed out this stencil that I need. Okay, great. Next thing is I need to mix my paint or whatever it is that you decided you needed to do. It just helps you move along. Even if you're slow, you're still moving along. All right, the next question is by Alyssa Alexander. Alexand, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. She says, what do you enjoy the most out of all that you do? Do you, for example, like refinishing furniture more? Do you like doing a yard project, crafting with your cricket? Like, what is it that you enjoy? She wanted to know. Well, I absolutely love building things from scratch with wood. But honestly, I think anything that allows me to create something new or different, like upcycling, is what I love most. Not necessarily working out in the yard because I'm, you know, I'm just hot and sweaty out there most of the time. But when I'm in my garage and I have the Golden Girls playing and I've got my headphones on and I'm listening to Dorothy and Blanche and Rose and Sophia engaging in another one of their, you know, crazy adventures and I don't know about you, but when I watch this show, I mean, I have seen every episode, gosh, it feels like hundreds of times. There's always something new that I hear them say that I don't remember from the last time I watched. <laughs> Does that happen to you too? Because it happens to me all the time. And, and I'll hear jokes that I've heard many times before, and it still makes me laugh. It's just such a comforting show to watch. So when I'm working on projects and I'm listening to them and I've got the whole day or the whole weekend stretched out in front of me to work on this thing that I'm bringing to fruition with my own hands and tools, that is like the best. I love it. Absolutely. So the next question comes from Joseph Wood. He said, my question is, can you do some videos where you you have used thrifted stuff for construction? I know you did some work with Habitat, but their stores sell thrifted building supplies, cabinets, lumber. Okay, Joseph, I love Habitat. I love working. I love volunteering with them. I love their restore. When I stop there, I always look for building materials, but, you know, they're usually so limited, the one that I go to, that I never really find anything there. But there is a salvage shop that I go to that I mentioned before where I found those legs that I used to build the vanity. And I actually had cut them down stripped them and used those legs to build the entire vanity. So I, I do sometimes find these things and I'm able to use it for some sort of project. What, be, what would be amazing is 
being able to find like enough wood in order to build something cool. Like I've never really found something that's like windows and I'm using it to build something cool because it just depends on what I find. And I usually don't find a lot of stuff. All right, moving on to the next question. Jamie Alvarez says, you've been such a big inspiration for a lot of people. How does it feel to have made such an impact? Like for me, I started watching your videos and at the time I hated my job and I wanted to go back to school. I've since then graduated college and I have a job in engineering design. Jamie, that is so freaking amazing. I'm so happy for you that you were able to go back to school and get out of your job and go do something that you love. Oh, it just gives me the cold chills just thinking of of that passion and you just went for it. Good for you. So I will tell you a story in particular that melts my heart. Every time I think about it, it was the woman who had suffered from postpartum depression. She had three kids. And so after her third kid is when she started having postpartum depression. Well, one of her kids is special needs. So it was just very difficult for her going through this depression, but having also a special needs child and a newborn. So she emailed me and she said, you know, I found your video on how to use a jigsaw. And that video taught me how to use this so that I can build a bed for my special needs child. Because what was happening happening is her special needs child, her child, I'm going to stop saying special needs, but it's relevant to the story. Her child was waking up multiple times per night and she needed a specialized bed that would allow the little girl to soothe herself back to sleep. And I think the, I think if I'm remembering from her email, the little girl would like wanted to hide. She'd wake up in the middle of the night and she needed to feel like closed in. So this mom was able to build a bed for her that was a little higher than normal beds so that the little girl, if she'd wake up in the middle of the night, she could go underneath the bed where she felt like more comfortable and, you know, secure and she wouldn't go and wake the mom up. So the mom, this woman emailing me, she was happier. She was more rested. She felt amazing at having this new hobby that helped her pull herself out of her depression. So these kind of stories are just so amazing to hear about. And it doesn't have to be such a um, a story like that. It could just be, you know, hey, I, I really look forward to seeing your videos. Like it just, it's a bright spot in my day. That makes me feel good because, you know, there's times I think as a creator, you you look at the numbers too much. You start looking at, okay, how many likes did I get? How many dislikes? How many people, you know, commented? You start looking at that. And if it doesn't perform as well as maybe one of your other videos, you start doubting yourself. Oh, I'm just not creative. You know, maybe I'm just not as good as this other creator. And sometimes again, people leave nasty comments and you let that pull you down or you'll see a thumbs down and you're like, wait a minute does that person not realize how much time I spent on this video? What are they giving me a thumb down, thumbs down for? They didn't even tell me. Like, if you want to leave a thumbs down, give me some feedback or something. But then it's all the positive comments that you get. And that overshadows the negativity and, and just makes me feel so good. So to answer your question, how does it feel to have made such an impact? It feels wonderful. It feels wonderful. Because like I said, my purpose in life is to create, inspire, and teach. And if you notice when I put videos up, very rarely are those videos with music going fast and just trying to entertain you. Now, sometimes I will put those up just because I may not have a lot of time to edit that video and I just put music to it, but it doesn't happen very often. Most times I'm trying to show you something or teach you something or share an experience with you about what I did and did it work? Did it not work? Because I want you to take that information and be able to use it yourself. So for me to hear feedback that someone used something I said or was inspired by something I said is like the biggest, (laughs) the biggest compliment you could ever pay me. I just love it. So anyway, that's what I got for you. Do you have a question? Is there something that you wanted answered that I didn't get a chance to answer? You can definitely send me an email, serena at thriftdiving.com. If you're on Instagram, send me a DM at thriftdiving. I am over there pretty frequently and I'll answer your questions, but I might even answer them in an upcoming podcast (laughs) and I'll feature your name too. So send me an email. But next week, I'm not sure what I have for you next week. I'm going to be super busy. I've got, gosh, probably three or three projects that I have to get done. One of which is a office makeover for my husband. That's got to get done like next week. And I, I haven't even started. So back to that original thing. What do you hate? I hate getting started. I don't even want to start this project. But once I get it started, 
I'm rolling right along. So I'm not sure what we'll talk about next week, but you know, we're always going to be talking about something fun here at Thrift Diving. Remember, follow me on Instagram at Thrift Diving. And if you are interested in using tools and you want to learn how to use tools with me, go to thriftdiving.com slash tools and let me know. Sign up and I'll send you more information. Okay, guys, thank you so much for listening. And I will see you next episode.